My Life, and work by Henry Ford in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Introduction. What is the idea? We have only started on our development of our country. We have not as yet. With all our talk of wonderful progress, done more than scratch the surface. The progress has been wonderful enough, but when we compare what we have done with what there is to do, then our past accomplishments are as nothing. When we consider that more power is used merely in plowing the soil, than is used in all the industrial establishments of the country put together, an inklings of how much opportunity there is ahead. And now, with so many countries of the world in ferment and with so much unrest everywhere. Is an excellent time to suggest something of the things that may be done in the light of what has been done. When one speaks of increasing power, machinery, and industry, there comes up a picture of a cold, metallic sort of world in which great factories will drive away the trees, the flowers, the birds, and the green fields, and that then we shall have a world composed of metal machines and human machines. With all of that, I do not agree. I think that unless we know more about machines and their use, unless we better understand the mechanical portion of life, we cannot have the time to enjoy the trees and the birds and the flowers and the green fields. I think that we have already done too much toward banishing the pleasant things from life by thinking that there is some opposition between living and providing the means of living. We waste so much time and energy that we have little left over in which to enjoy ourselves. Power and machinery, money and goods, are useful only as they set us free to live. They are but means to an end. For instance, I do not consider the machines which bear my name simply as machines. If that was all there was to it, I would do something else. I take them as concrete evidence of the working out of a theory of business, which. I hope is something more than a theory of business, a theory that looks toward making this world a better place in which to live. The fact that the commercial success of the Ford Motor Company has been most unusual is important only because it serves to demonstrate, in a way which no one can fail to understand, that the theory to date is right. Considered solely in this light, I can criticize the prevailing system of industry. And the organization of money and society from the standpoint of one who has not been beaten by them, as things are now organized, I could, were I thinking only, selfishly, ask for no change. If I merely want money, the present system is all right; it gives money in plenty to me. But I am thinking of service. The present system does not permit of the best service, because it encourages every kind of waste. It keeps many men from getting the full return from service, and it is going nowhere. It is all a matter of better planning and adjustment. I have no quarrel with the general attitude of scoffing at new ideas. It is better to be skeptical of all new ideas and to insist upon being shown rather than to rush around in a continuous brainstorm after every new idea. Skepticism, if by that we mean cautiousness. Is the balance wheel of civilization? Most of the present acute troubles of the world arise out of taking on new ideas without first carefully investigating to discover if they are good ideas. An idea is not necessarily good because it is old, or necessarily bad because it is new. But if an old idea works, then the weight of the evidence is all in its favor. Ideas are of themselves extraordinarily valuable, but an idea is just an idea. Almost anyone can think up an idea. The thing that counts is developing it into a practical product. I am now most interested in fully demonstrating that the ideas we have put into practice are capable of the largest application. That they have nothing peculiarly to do with motor cars or tractors, but form something in the nature of a universal code. I am quite certain that it is the natural code. And I want to demonstrate it so thoroughly that it will be accepted not as a new idea, but as a natural code. The natural thing to do is to work to recognize that prosperity and happiness can be obtained only through honest effort. Human ills flow largely from attempting to escape from this natural course. I have no suggestion which goes beyond accepting in its fullest this principle of nature. I take 
it for granted that we must work. All that we have done comes as the result of a certain insistence. That since we must work, it is better to work intelligently and forehandedly. That the better we do our work, the better off. We shall be, all of which I conceive to be merely elemental common sense. I am not a reformer. I think there is entirely too much attempt at reforming in the world, and that we pay too much attention to reformers. We have to kinds off reformers. Both are nuisances. The man who calls himself a reformer wants to smash things. He is the sort of man who would tear up a whole shirt. Because the collar button did not fit the buttonhole, it would never occur to him to enlarge the buttonhole. This sort of reformer never under any circumstances knows what he is doing. Experience and reform do not go together. A reformer cannot keep his zeal at white heat in the presence of a fact. He must discard all facts. Since 1914 a great many persons have received brand new intellectual outfits. Many are beginning to think for the first time. They open their eyes and realize that they were in the world. Then, with a thrill of independence, they realize that they could look at the world critically. They did so and found it faulty. The intoxication of assuming the masterful position of a critic of the social system, which it is every man's right to assume, eh, is unbalancing at first. The very young critic is very much unbalanced. He is strongly in favor of wiping out the old order and starting a new one. They actually managed to start a new world in Russia. It is there that the work of the world makers can best be studied. We learn from Russia that it is the minority and not the majority who determine destructive action. We learn also that while men may decree social laws, in conflict with natural laws, nature vetoes those laws more ruthlessly than did the czars. Nature has vetoed the whole Soviet Republic for it sought to deny nature. It denied above all else the right to the fruits of labor. Some people say, Russia will have to go to work. But that does not describe the case. The fact is that poor Russia is at work. But her work counts for nothing. It is not free work. In the United States, a workman works eight hours a day. In Russia, he works 12 to 14. In the United States, if a workman wishes to lay off a day or a week and is able to afford it, there is nothing to prevent him. In Russia, under Sovietism, the workman goes to work whether he wants to or not. The freedom of the citizen has disappeared in the discipline of a prison-like monotony in which all are treated alike. That is slavery. Freedom is the right to work a decent length of time and to get a decent living for doing so. To be able to arrange the little personal details of one's own life. It is the aggregate of these and many other items of freedom. Which makes up the great idealistic freedom. The minor forms of freedom lubricate the everyday life. Of all of us, Russia could not get along without intelligence and experience. As soon as she began to run her factories by committees, they went to rack and ruin. There was more debate than production. As soon as they threw out the skilled man, thousands of tons of precious materials were spoiled. The fanatics talked the people into starvation. The Soviets are now offering the engineers, the administrators, the foremen and superintendents, whom at first they drove out. Large sums of money if only they will come back. Bolshevism is now crying for the brains and experience, which it yesterday treated so ruthlessly. All that reform did to Russia was to block production. There is in this country a sinister element that desires to creep in between the men who work with their hands and the men who think and plan for the men who will work with their hands. The same influence that drove the brains, experience, and ability out of Russia is busily engaged in raising prejudice here. We must not suffer the stranger, the destroyer, the hater of happy humanity to divide our people. In unity is American strength and freedom. On the other hand, we have a different kind of reformer who never calls himself one. He is singularly like the radical reformer. The radical has had no experience and does not want it. The other class of reformer has had plenty of experience, but it does him no good. I refer to the reactionary who will be surprised to find himself 
put in exactly the same class as the Bolshevist. He wants to go back to some previous condition. Not because it was the best condition, but because he thinks he knows about that condition. The one crowd wants to smash up the whole world in order to make a better one. The other holds the world as so good that it might well be let stand as it is and decay. The second notion arises as does the first. Out of not using the eyes to see with, it is perfectly possible to smash this world. But it is not possible to build a new one. It is possible to prevent the world from going forward. But it is not possible then to prevent it from going back, from decaying. It is foolish to expect that, if everything be overturned, everyone will thereby get three meals a day, or, should everything be petrified, that thereby 6% interest may be paid. The trouble is that reformers and reactionaries alike get away from the realities, from the primary functions. One of the counsels of caution is to be very certain that we do not mistake a reactionary turn for a return of common sense. We have passed through a period of fireworks of every description and the making of a great many idealistic maps of progress. We did not get anywhere. It was a convention, not a march. Lovely things were said. But when we got home, we found the furnace out. Reactionaries have frequently taken advantage of the recoil from such a period, and they have promised the good old times, which usually means the bad old abuses. And because they are perfectly void of vision, they are sometimes regarded as practical men. Their return to power is often hailed as the return of common sense. The primary functions are agriculture, manufacture, and transportation. Community life is impossible without them. They hold the world together. Raising things, making things, and earning things are as primitive as human need and yet as modern as anything can be. They are of the essence of physical life. When they cease, community life ceases. Things do get out of shape in this present world, under the present system, but we may hope for a betterment if the foundations stand sure. The great delusion is that one may change the foundation. Usurp the part of destiny in the social process. The foundations of society are the men and means to grow things, to make things, and to carry things. As long as agriculture, manufacture, and transportation survive, the world can survive any economic or social change. As we serve our jobs, we serve the world. There is plenty of work to do. Business is merely work. Speculation in things already produced, that is not business. It is just more or less respectable graft. But it cannot be legislated out of existence. Laws can do very little. Law never does anything constructive. It can never be more than a policeman. And so it is a waste of time to look to our state capitals or to Washington to do that. Which law was not designed to do? As long as we look to legislation to cure poverty or to abolish special privilege, we are going to see poverty spread and special privilege grow. We have had enough of looking to Washington. And we have had enough of legislators, not so much, however. In this as in other countries, promising laws to do that which laws cannot do. When you get a whole country, as did ours, thinking that Washington is a sort of heaven and behind its clouds dwell omniscience and omnipotence, you are educating that country into a dependent state of mind, which augurs ill for the future. Our help does not come from Washington, but from ourselves. Our help may, however, go to Washington as a sort of central distribution point where all our efforts are coordinated for the general good. We may help the government. The government cannot help us. The slogan of less government in business and more business in government is a very good one. Not mainly on account of business or government, but on account of the people. Business is not the reason why the United States was founded. The Declaration of Independence is not a business charter. Nor is the Constitution of the United States a commercial schedule. The United States, its land, people, government, and businessy are but methods by which the life of the people is made worthwhile. The government is a servant and never should be anything but a servant the moment the people become adjuncts to government. Then the law of retribution begins to work, for such a relation is unnatural, 
immoral, and inhuman. We cannot live without business. And we cannot live without government. Business and government are necessary as servants. Like water and grain, as masters they overturn the natural order. The welfare of the country is squarely up to us as individuals. That is where it should be, and that is where it is safest. Governments can promise something for nothing, but they cannot deliver. They can juggle the currencies as they did in Europe, and as bankers the world overdo. As long as they can get the benefit of the juggling with a patter of solemn nonsense. But it is work and work alone. That can continue to deliver the goods, and that, down in his heart, is what every man knows. There is little chance of an intelligent people, such as ours, ruining the fundamental processes of economic life. Most men know they cannot get something for nothing. Most men feel, even if they do not know, that money is not wealth. The ordinary theories which promise everything to everybody and demand nothing from anybody are probably denied by the instincts of the ordinary man. Even when he does not find reasons against them, he knows they are wrong. That is enough. The present order, always clumsy, often stupid, and in many ways imperfect, has this advantage over any other. It works. Doubtless our order will merge by degrees into another. And the new one will also work, but not so much by reason of what it is, as by reason of what men will bring into it. The reason why Bolshevism did not work, and cannot work, is not economic. It does not matter whether industry is privately managed, or socially controlled. It does not matter whether you call the workers share wages or dividends, it does not matter. Whether you regimentalize the people as to food, clothing, and shelter, or whether you allow them to eat, dress, and live as they like. The incapacity of the Bolshevist leaders is indicated by the fuss they made over such details. Bolshevism failed because it was both unnatural and immoral. Our system stands. Is it wrong? Of course, it is wrong at a thousand points. Is it clumsy? Of course, it is clumsy. By all right and reason, it ought to break down. But it does not, because it is instinct with certain economic and moral fundamentals. The economic fundamental is labor. Labor is the human element which makes the fruitful seasons of the earth useful to men. It is men's labor that makes the harvest what it is. That is the economic fundamental. Every one of us is working with material which we did not and could not create, but which was presented to us by nature. The moral fundamental is man's right in his labor. This is variously stated. It is sometimes called the right of property. It is sometimes masked in the command, thou shalt not steal. It is the other man's right in his property. That makes stealing a crime. When a man has earned his bread, he has a right to that bread. If another steals it, he does more than steal bread. He invades a sacred human right. If we cannot produce, we cannot have. But some say if we produce, it is only for the capitalists. Capitalists who become such. Because they provide better means of production are of the foundation of society. They have really nothing of their own. They merely manage property for the benefit of others. Capitalists who become such through trading. In money are a temporarily necessary evil. They may not be evil at all if their money goes to. Production, if their money goes to complicating distribution, to raising barriers between the producer and the consumer, then they are evil capitalists, and they will pass away. When money is better adjusted to work, and money will become better adjusted to work when it is fully realized that through work and work alone may health, wealth, and happiness inevitably be secured. There is no reason why a man who is willing to work should not be able to work and to receive the full value of his work? There is equally no reason why a man who can but will not work should not receive the full value of his services to the community. He should most certainly be permitted to take away from the community an equivalent of what he contributes to it. If he contributes nothing, he should take away nothing. He should have the freedom of starvation. We are not getting anywhere when we insist that every man ought to have more than he deserves to have, just because some do get more than they deserve to have. There can be no greater absurdity. 
and no greater disservice to humanity in general than to insist that all men are equal. Most certainly all men are not equal. And any democratic conception which strives to make men equal is only an effort to block progress. Men cannot be of equal service. The men of larger ability are less numerous than the men of smaller ability. It is possible for a mass of the smaller men to pull the larger ones down, but in so doing, they pull themselves down. It is the larger men who give the leadership to the community and enable the smaller men to live with less effort. The conception of democracy, which names a leveling down of ability, makes for waste. No two things in nature are alike. We build our cars absolutely interchangeable. All parts are as nearly alike as chemical analysis. The finest machinery and the finest workmanship can make them. No fitting of any kind is required. And it would certainly seem that two Fords standing side by side, looking exactly alike and made so exactly alike that any part could be taken out of one and put into the other, would be alike. But they are not. They will have different road habits. We have men who have driven hundreds, and in some cases thousands of Fords, and they say that no to ever act precisely the same, that if they should drive a new car for an hour or even less, and then the car were mixed with a bunch of other new ones, also each driven for a single hour and under the same conditions, that although they could not recognize the car, they had been driving merely by looking at it. They could do so by driving it. I have been speaking in general terms. Let us be more concrete. A man ought to be able to live on a scale commensurate with the service that he renders. This is rather a good time to talk about this point. For we have recently been through a period when the rendering of service was the last thing that most people thought of. We were getting to a place where no one cared about costs or service. Orders came without effort, whereas once it was the customer who favored the merchant by dealing with him. Conditions changed until it was the merchant who favored the customer by selling to him. That is bad for business. Monopoly is bad for business. Profiteering is bad for business. The lack of necessity to hustle is bad for business. Business is never as healthy as when, like a chicken. It must do a certain amount of scratching for what it gets. Things were coming too easily. There was a letdown of the principle that an honest relation ought to obtain between values and prices. The public no longer had to be catered to. There was even a public be damned attitude in many places. It was intensely bad for business. Some men called that abnormal condition prosperity. It was not prosperity. It was just a needless money chase. Money chasing is not business. It is very easy, unless one keeps a plan thoroughly in mind, to get burdened with money and then, in an effort to make more money, to forget all about selling to the people what they want. Business on a money-making basis is most insecure. It is a touch-and-go affair, moving irregularly and rarely over a term of years amounting too much. It is the function of business to produce for consumption and not for money or speculation. Producing for consumption implies that the quality of the article produced will be high and that the price will be low. That the article be one which serves the people and not merely the producer. If the money feature is twisted out of its proper perspective, then the production will be twisted to serve the producer. The producer depends for his prosperity upon serving the people. He may get by for a while serving himself, but if he does, it will be purely accidental. And when the people wake up to the fact that they are not being served, the end of that producer is in sight. During the boom period, the larger effort of production was to serve itself and hence, the moment the people woke up, many producers went to smash. They said that they had entered into a period of depression. Really, they had not. They were simply trying to pit nonsense against sense which is something that cannot successfully be done. Being greedy for money is the surest way not to get it. But when one serves for the sake of service, for the satisfaction of doing that which one believes to be right, then money abundantly takes care of itself. Money comes naturally as the result of service. And it is absolutely necessary to have money. 
But we do not want to forget that the end of money is not ease, but the opportunity to perform more service. In my mind, nothing is more abhorrent than a life of ease. None of us has any right to ease. There is no place in civilization for the idler. Any scheme looking to abolishing money is only making affairs more complex, for we must have a measure that our present system of money is a satisfactory basis. For exchange is a matter of grave doubt. That is a question which I shall talk of in a subsequent chapter. The gist of my objection to the present monetary system is that it tends to become a thing of itself and to block instead of facilitate production. My effort is in the direction of simplicity. People in general have so little, and it costs so much to buy even the barest necessities, let alone that share of the luxuries. To which I think everyone is entitled, because nearly everything that we make is much more complex than it needs to be. Our clothing, our food, our household furnishings, all could be much simpler than they now are, and at the same time be better looking. Things in past ages were made in certain ways, and makers since then have just followed. I do not mean that we should adopt freak styles. There is no necessity for that. Clothing need not be a bag with a hole cut in it. That might be easy to make, but it would be inconvenient to wear. A blanket does not require much tailoring, but none of us could get much work done if we went around Indian fashion in blankets. Real simplicity means that which gives the very best service and is the most convenient in use. The trouble with drastic reforms is they always insist that a man be made over in order to use certain designed articles. I think that dress reform for women. Which seems to mean ugly clothes, must always originate with plain women who want to make everyone else look plain. That is not the right process. Start with an article that suits, and then study to find some way of eliminating the entirely useless parts. This applies to everything: a shoe, a dress, a house, a piece of machinery, a railroad, a steamship, an airplane. As we cut out useless parts and simplify necessary ones. We also cut down the cost of making. This is simple logic, but oddly enough, the ordinary process starts with a cheapening of the manufacturing, instead of with a simplifying of the article. The start ought to be with the article. First, we ought to find whether it is as well made as it should be. Does it give the best possible service? Then, are the materials the best or merely the most expensive? Then, can its complexity and weight be cut down, and so on? There is no more sense in having extra weight in an article than there is in the cockade on a coachman's hat. In fact, there is not as much, for the cockade may help the coachman to identify his hat, while the extra weight means only a waste of strength. I cannot imagine where the delusion that weight means strength came from. It is all well enough in a pile driver, but why move a heavy weight if we are not going to hit anything with it? In transportation, why put extra weight in a machine? Why not add it to the load that the machine is designed to carry? Fat men cannot run as fast as thin men, but we build most of our vehicles as though dead weight fat increased speed. A deal of poverty grows out of the carriage of excess weight. Some day we shall discover how further to eliminate weight. Take wood, for example. For certain purposes, wood is now the best substance we know. But wood is extremely wasteful. The wood in a Ford car contains 30 pounds of water. There must be some way of doing better than that. There must be some method by which we can gain the same strength and elasticity without having to lug useless weight, and so through a thousand processes, the farmer makes to complex an affair out of his daily work. I believe that the average farmer puts to a really useful purpose only about five percent of the energy that he spends. If anyone ever equipped a factory in the style, say, the average farm is fitted out, the place would be cluttered with men. The worst factory in Europe is hardly as bad as the average farm barn. Power is utilized to the least possible degree. Not only is everything done by hand, but seldom is a thought given to logical arrangement. A farmer doing his chores will walk up and down a rickety ladder a dozen times. He will carry water for years instead of putting in a few lengths of pipe. 
His whole idea, when there is extra work to do, is to hire extra men. He thinks of putting money into improvements as an expense. Farm products at their lowest prices are dearer than they ought to be. Farm profits at their highest are lower than they ought to be. It is waste motion, waste effort, that makes farm prices high and profits low. On my own farm at Dearborn, we do everything by machinery. We have eliminated a great number of wastes. But we have not as yet touched on real economy. We have not yet been able to put in five or ten years of intense night and day study to discover what really ought to be done. We have left more undone than we have done. Yet at no time, no matter what the value of crops, have we failed to turn a first-class profit? We are not farmers, we are industrialists on the farm. The moment the farmer considers himself as an industrialist, with a horror of waste either in material or in men, then we are going to have farm products so low-priced that all will have enough to eat and the profits will be so satisfactory that farming will be considered as among the least hazardous and most profitable of occupations. Lack of knowledge of what is going on and lack of knowledge of what the job really is and the best way of doing it are the reasons why farming is thought not to pay. Nothing could pay the way farming is conducted. The farmer follows luck and his forefathers. He does not know how economically to produce and he does not know how to market. A manufacturer who knew how neither to produce nor to market would not long stay in business that the farmer can stay on. Shows how wonderfully profitable farming can be, the way to attain low-priced, high-volume production in the factory or on the farm, and low-priced. High-volume production means plenty for everyone, is quite simple. The trouble is that the general tendency is to complicate very simple affairs. Take, for an instance, an improvement. When we talk about improvements, usually, we have in mind some change in a product. An improved product is one that has been changed. That is not my idea. I do not believe in starting to make until I have discovered the best possible thing. This, of course, does not mean that a product should never be changed, but I think that it will be found more economical in the end, not even to try to produce an article. Until you have fully satisfied yourself that utility, design, and material are the best. If your researches do not give you that confidence, then keep right on searching until you find confidence. The place to start manufacturing is with the article, the factory, the organization. The selling and the financial plans will shape themselves to the article. You will have a cutting edge on your business chisel and in the end, you will save time. Rushing into manufacturing without being certain of the product is the unrecognized cause of many business failures. People seem to think that the big thing is the factory or the store or the financial backing or the management. The big thing is the product. And any hurry in getting into fabrication before designs are completed is just so much waste time. I spent 12 years before I had a Model T, which is what is known today as the Ford car. That suited me. We did not attempt to go into real production until we had a real product. That product has not been essentially changed. We are constantly experimenting with new ideas. If you travel the roads in the neighborhood of Dearborn, you can find all sorts of models of Ford cars. They are experimental cars. They are not new models. I do not believe in letting any good idea get by me but I will not quickly decide whether an idea is good or bad. If an idea seems good or seems even to have possibilities, I believe in doing whatever is necessary to test out the idea from every angle. But testing out the idea is something very different from making a change in the car. Where most manufacturers find themselves quicker to make a change in the product than in the method of manufacturing, we follow exactly the opposite course. Our big changes have been in methods of manufacturing. They never stand still. I believe that there is hardly a single operation in the making of our car that is the same as when we made our first car of the present model. That is why we make them so cheaply. The few changes that have been made in the car have been in the direction of convenience in use or where we found that a change in design might give added strength. 
the materials in the car change as we learn more and more about materials. Also, we do not want to be held up in production or have the expense of production increased by any possible shortage in a particular material. So we have for most parts worked out substitute materials. Vanadium steel, for instance, is our principal steel. With it, we can get the greatest strength with the least weight. But it would not be good business to let our whole future depend upon being able to get vanadium steel. We have worked out a substitute. All our steels are special. But for every one of them, we have at least one, and sometimes several, fully proved and tested substitutes. And so on through all of our materials, and likewise with our parts. In the beginning, we made very few of our parts, and none of our motors. Now we make all our motors and most of our parts, because we find it cheaper to do so. But also we aim to make some of every part so that we cannot be caught in any market emergency or be crippled by some outside manufacturer being unable to fill his orders. The prices on glass were run up outrageously high during the war. We are among the largest users of glass in the country. Now we are putting up our own glass factory. If we had devoted all of this energy to making changes in the product, we should be nowhere. But by not changing the product, we are able to give our energy to the improvement of the making. The principal part of a chisel is the cutting edge. If there is a single principle on which our business rests, it is that. It makes no difference how finely made a chisel is, or what splendid steel it has in it, or how well it is forged. If it has no cutting edge, it is not a chisel. It is just a piece of metal. All of which being translated means that it is what a thing does. Not what it is supposed to do, that matters. What is the use of putting a tremendous force behind a blunt chisel if a light blow on a sharp chisel will do the work? The chisel is there to cut, not to be hammered. The hammering is only incidental to the job. So if we want to work, why not concentrate on the work and do it in the quickest possible fashion? The cutting edge of merchandising is the point where the product touches the consumer. An unsatisfactory product is one that has a dull cutting edge. A lot of waste effort is needed to put it through. The cutting edge of a factory is the man and the machine on the job. If the man is not right, the machine cannot be. If the machine is not right, the man cannot be. For anyone to be required to use more force, then is absolutely necessary for the job in hand is waste. The essence of my idea then is that waste and greed block the delivery of true service. Both waste and greed are unnecessary. Waste is due largely to not understanding what one does or being careless in doing of it. Greed is merely a species of nearsightedness. I have striven toward manufacturing with a minimum of waste both of materials and of human effort, and then toward distribution at a minimum of profit. Depending for the total profit upon the volume of distribution in the process of manufacturing, I want to distribute the maximum of wage, that is, the maximum of buying power, since also this makes for a minimum cost. And we sell at a minimum profit, we can distribute a product in consonance with buying power. Thus, everyone who is connected with us, either as a manager, worker, or purchaser, is the better for our existence. The institution that we have erected is performing a service. That is the only reason I have for talking about it. The principles of that service are these. 1. An absence of fear of the future and a veneration for the past. One who fears the future, who fears failure, limits his activities. Failure is only the opportunity more intelligently to begin again. There is no disgrace in honest failure. There is disgrace in fearing to fail. What is past is useful only as it suggests ways and means for progress. 2. A disregard of competition. Whoever does a thing best ought to be the one to do it. It is criminal to try to get business away from another man. Criminal because one is then trying to lower for personal gain the condition of one's fellow man to rule by force instead of by intelligence. 3. The putting of service before profit, without a profit. Business cannot extend. There is nothing inherently wrong about making a profit. 
well-conducted business enterprise cannot fail to return a profit, but profit must and inevitably will come as a reward for good. Service, it cannot be the basis, it must be the result of service. For manufacturing is not buying low and selling high. It is the process of buying materials fairly and with the smallest possible addition of cost, transforming those materials into a consumable product and giving it to the consumer. Gambling, speculating, and sharp dealing tend only to clog this progression. How all of this arose, how it has worked out, and how it applies generally are the subjects of these chapters. Chapter 1. The Beginning of Business On May 31, 1921, the Ford Motor Company turned out car number 5 million. It is out in my museum along with the gasoline buggy that I began work on 30 years before and which first ran satisfactorily along in the spring of 1893. I was running it when the Bobo Lynx came to Dearborn, and they always come on April 2nd. There is all the difference in the world, in the appearance of the two vehicles, and almost as much difference in construction and materials. But in fundamentals, the two are curiously alike, except that the old buggy has on it a few wrinkles that we have not yet quite adopted in our modern car. For that first car or buggy, even though it had but two cylinders, would make 20 miles an hour and run 60 miles on the three gallons of gas, the little tank held and is as good today as the day it was built. The development in methods of manufacture and in materials has been greater than the development in basic design. The whole design has been refined. The present Ford car, which is the Model T, has four cylinders and a self-starter. It is in every way a more convenient and an easier riding car. It is simpler than the first car, but almost every point in it may be found also in the first car. The changes have been brought about through experience in the making and not through any change in the basic principle, which I take to be an important fact demonstrating that. Given a good idea to start with, it is better to concentrate on perfecting it than to hunt around for a new idea. One idea at a time is about as much as anyone can handle. It was life on the farm that drove me into devising ways and means to better transportation. I was born on July 30, 1863, on a farm at Dearborn, Michigan. And my earliest recollection is that, considering the results, there was too much work on the place. That is the way I still feel about farming. There is a legend that my parents were very poor and that the early days were hard ones. Certainly they were not rich, but neither were they poor. As Michigan farmers went, we were prosperous. The house in which I was born is still standing, and it and the farm are part of my present holding. There was too much hard hand labor on our own, and all other farms of the time. Even when very young I suspected that, much might somehow be done in a better way. That is what took me into mechanics. Although my mother always said that I was born a mechanic, I had a kind of workshop with odds and ends of metal for tools before I had anything else. In those days, we did not have the toys of today. What we had were homemade. My toys were all tools, they still are. And every fragment of machinery was a treasure. The biggest event of those early years was meeting with a road engine about eight miles out of Detroit one day. When we were driving to town, I was then 12 years old. The second biggest event was getting a watch, which happened in the same year. I remember that engine as though I had seen it only yesterday, for it was the first vehicle other than horse-drawn that I had ever seen. It was intended primarily for driving threshing machines and sawmills and was simply a portable engine and boiler mounted on wheels with a water tank and coal car trailing behind. I had seen plenty of these engines hauled around by horses, but this one had a chain that made a connection between the engine and the rear wheels of the wagon-like frame on which the boiler was mounted. The engine was placed over the boiler and one man standing on the platform behind the boiler shoveled coal, managed the throttle and did the steering. It had been made by Nichols, Shepard, and Company of Battle Creek. I found that out at once. The engine had stopped to let us pass with our horses, 
and I was off the wagon and talking to the engineer before my father, who was driving, knew what I was up to. The engineer was very glad to explain the whole affair. He was proud of it. He showed me how the chain was disconnected from the propelling wheel and a belt put on to drive other machinery. He told me that the engine made to 100 revolutions a minute and that the chain pinion could be shifted to let the wagon stop while the engine was still running. This last is a feature which, although in different fashion, is incorporated into modern automobiles. It was not important with steam engines, which are easily stopped and started, but it became very important with the gasoline engine. It was that engine which took me into automotive transportation. I tried to make models of it, and some years later I did make one that ran very well. But from the time I saw that road engine as a boy of 12 right forward to today, my great interest has been in making a machine that would travel the roads. Driving to town I always had a pocket full of trinkets, nuts, washers, and odds and ends of machinery. Often I took a broken watch and tried to put it together. When I was 13 I managed for the first time to put a watch together so that it would keep time. By the time I was 15, I could do almost anything in watch repairing, although my tools were of the crudest. There is an immense amount to be learned, simply, by tinkering with things. It is not possible to learn from books how everything is made. And a real mechanic ought to know how nearly everything is made. Machines are to a mechanic what books are to a writer. He gets ideas from them. And if he has any brains, he will apply those ideas. From the beginning, I never could work up much interest in the labor of farming. I wanted to have something to do with machinery. My father was not entirely in sympathy with my bent toward mechanics. He thought that I ought to be a farmer. When I left school at 17 and became an apprentice in the machine shop of the Drydeck Engine Works, I was all but given up for lost. I passed my apprenticeship without trouble, that is. I was qualified to be a machinist long before my three-year term had expired. And having a liking for fine work and a leaning toward watches, I worked nights at repairing in a jewelry shop. At one period of those early days, I think that I must have had fully 300 watches. I thought that I could build a serviceable watch for around 30 cents and nearly started in the business. But I did not because I figured out that watches were not universal necessities and therefore people generally would not buy them. Just how I reached that surprising conclusion I am unable to state. I did not like the ordinary jewelry and watch making work, excepting where the job was hard to do. Even then, I wanted to make something in quantity. It was just about the time when the standard railroad time was being arranged. We had formerly been on sun time and for quite a while. Just as in our present daylight saving days, the railroad time differed from the local time. That bothered me a good deal. And so I succeeded in making a watch that kept both times. It had two dials, and it was quite a curiosity in the neighborhood. In 1879, that is, about four years after I first saw that Nichols Shepherd machine, I managed to get a chance to run one, and when my apprenticeship was over, I worked with a local representative of the Westinghouse Company of Schenectady as an expert in the setting up and repair of their road engines. The engine they put out was much the same as the Nichols Shepherd engine, excepting that the engine was up in front, the boiler in the rear, and the power was applied to the back wheels by a belt. They could make 12 miles an hour on the road, even though the self-propelling feature was only an incident of the construction. They were sometimes used as tractors to pull heavy loads and if the owner also happened to be in the threshing machine business, he hitched his threshing machine and other paraphernalia to the engine in moving from farm to farm. What bothered me was the weight and the cost. They weighed a couple of tons and were far too expensive to be owned by other than a farmer with a great deal of land. They were mostly employed by people who went into threshing as a business or who had sawmills or some other line. That required portable power. Even before that time, I had the idea of making some kind of a light steam car that would take the place of horses. More especially, 
however, as a tractor to attend to the excessively hard labor of plowing. It occurred to me, as I remember somewhat vaguely, that precisely the same idea might be applied to a carriage or a wagon on the road. A horseless carriage was a common idea. People had been talking about carriages without horses for many years back. In fact, ever since the steam engine was invented, but the idea of the carriage, at first, did not seem so practical to me as the idea of an engine to do the harder farm work. And of all the work on the farm plowing was the hardest. Our roads were poor and we had not the habit of getting around. One of the most remarkable features of the automobile on the farm is the way that it has broadened the farmer's life. We simply took for granted that unless the errand were urgent, we would not go to town, and I think we rarely made more than a trip a week. In bad weather, we did not go even that often. Being a full-fledged machinist, and with a very fair workshop on the farm, it was not difficult for me to build a steam wagon or tractor. In the building of it came the idea that perhaps it might be made for road use. I felt perfectly certain that horses, considering all the bother of attending them and the expense of feeding, did not earn their keep. The obvious thing to do was to design and build a steam engine that would be light enough to run an ordinary wagon or to pull a plow. I thought it more important first to develop the tractor, to lift farm drudgery off flesh and blood and lay it on steel. And motors has been my most constant ambition. It was circumstances that took me first into the actual manufacture of road cars. I found eventually that people were more interested in something that would travel on the road than in something that would do the work on the farms. In fact, I doubt that the light farm tractor could have been introduced on the farm had not the farmer had his eyes open slowly but surely by the automobile. But that is getting ahead of the story. I thought the farmer would be more interested in the tractor. I built a steam car that ran. It had a kerosene heated boiler and it developed plenty of power and a neat control, which is so easy with a steam throttle. But the boiler was dangerous to get the requisite power without too big and heavy a power plant required that the engine work under high pressure. Sitting on a high pressure steam boiler is not altogether pleasant. To make it even reasonably safe required an excess of weight that nullified the economy of the high pressure. For two years, I kept experimenting with various sorts of boilers. The engine and control problems were simple enough. And then I definitely abandoned the whole idea of running a road vehicle by steam. I knew that in England they had what amounted to locomotives running on the roads hauling lines of trailers. And also there was no difficulty in designing a big steam tractor for use on a large farm. But ours were not then English roads. They would have stalled or racked to pieces the strongest and heaviest road tractor. And anyway the manufacturing of a big tractor, which only a few wealthy farmers could buy did not seem to me worthwhile. But I did not give up the idea of a horseless carriage. The work with the Westinghouse representative only served to confirm the opinion I had formed that steam was not suitable for light vehicles. That is why I stayed only a year with that company. There was nothing more that the big steam tractors and engines could teach me, and I did not want to waste time on something that would lead nowhere. A few years before, it was while I was an apprentice, I read in the World of Science an English publication of the silent gas engine, which was then coming out in England. I think it was the auto engine. It ran with illuminating gas, had a single large cylinder, and the power impulses being thus intermittent required an extremely heavy flying wheel. As far as weight was concerned, it gave nothing like the power per pound of metal that a steam engine gave, and the use of illuminating gas seemed to dismiss it as even a possibility for road use. It was interesting to me only as all machinery was interesting. I followed in the English and American magazines, which we got in the shop the development of the engine, and most particularly the hints of the possible replacement of the illuminating gas fuel by a gas formed by the vaporization of gasoline. The idea of gas engines was by no means new, but this was the first time that a really serious effort had been made to put them on the market. They were received with interest rather than enthusiasm. 
and I do not recall anyone who thought that the internal combustion engine could ever have more than a limited use. All the wise people demonstrated conclusively that the engine could not compete with steam. They never thought that it might carve out a career for itself. That is the way with wise people. They are so wise and practical that they always know to a dot just why something cannot be done. They always know the limitations. That is why I never employ an expert in full bloom. If ever I wanted to kill opposition by unfair means, I would endow the opposition with experts. They would have so much good advice that I could be sure they would do little work. The gas engine interested me, and I followed its progress. But only from curiosity, until about 1885 or 1886 when. The steam engine being discarded as the motive power for the carriage. That I intended some day to build, I had to look around for another sort of motive power. In 1885 I repaired an auto engine. At the Eagle Iron Works in Detroit. No one in town knew anything about them. There was a rumor that I did and. Although I had never before been in contact with one, I undertook and carried through the job. That gave me a chance to study the new engine at first hand. And in 1887, I built one on the auto for cycle model just to see if I understood the principles. For cycle means that. The piston traverses the cylinder for times to get one power impulse. The first stroke draws in the gas, the second compresses it. The third is the explosion or power stroke, while the fourth stroke exhausts the waste gas. The little model worked well enough. It had a 1-inch bore and a 3-inch stroke, operated with gasoline. And while it did not develop much power, it was slightly lighter in proportion than the engines being offered commercially. I gave it away later to a young man who wanted it for something or other and whose name I have forgotten, it was eventually destroyed. That was the beginning of the work with the internal combustion engine. I was then on the farm to which I had returned, more because I wanted to experiment than because I wanted to farm, and now being an all-around machinist, I had a first-class workshop to replace the toy shop of earlier days. My father offered me 40 acres of timber land, provided I gave up being a machinist. I agreed in a provisional way. For cutting the timber gave me a chance to get married. I fitted out a sawmill and a portable engine and started to cut out and saw up the timber on the tract. Some of the first of that lumber went into a cottage on my new farm and in it we began our married life. It was not a big house, 31 feet square and only a story and a half high, but it was a comfortable place. I added to it my workshop and when I was not cutting timber, I was working on the gas engines, learning what they were and how they acted. I read everything I could find. But the greatest knowledge came from the work. A gas engine is a mysterious sort of thing. It will not always go the way it should. You can imagine how those first engines acted. It was in 1890 that I began on a double cylinder engine. It was quite impractical to consider the single cylinder. For transportation purposes, the flywheel had to be entirely too heavy. Between making the first for cycle engine of the auto type and the start on a double cylinder, I had made a great many experimental engines out of tubing. I fairly knew my way about the double cylinder I thought could be applied to a road vehicle. And my original idea was to put it on a bicycle with a direct connection to the crankshaft and allowing for the rear wheel of the bicycle to act as the balance wheel. The speed was going to be varied only by the throttle. I never carried out this plan because it soon became apparent that the engine, gasoline tank, and the various necessary controls would be entirely too heavy for a bicycle. The plan of the two opposed cylinders was that while one would be delivering power, the other would be exhausting. This naturally would not require so heavy a flywheel to even the application of power. The work started in my shop on the farm. Then I was offered a job with the Detroit Electric Company. As an engineer and machinist at $45 a month, I took it because that was more money than the farm was bringing me, and I had decided to get away from farm life anyway. The timber had all been cut. We rented a house on Bagley Avenue, Detroit. The workshop came along, and I set it up in a brick shed at the back of the house. 
During the first several months, I was in the night shift at the electric light plant, which gave me very little time for experimenting. But after that, I was in the day shift and every night and all of every Saturday night, I worked on the new motor. I cannot say that it was hard work. No work with interest is ever hard. I always am certain of results. They always come if you work hard enough. But it was a very great thing to have my wife even more confident than I was. She has always been that way. I had to work from the ground up, that is. Although I knew that a number of people were working on horseless carriages, I could not know what they were doing. The hardest problems to overcome were in the making and breaking of the spark and in the avoidance of excess weight for the transmission, the steering gear, and the general construction I could draw on my experience with the steam tractors. In 1892, I completed my first motor car, but it was not until the spring of the following year that it ran to my satisfaction. This first car had something of the appearance of a buggy. There were two cylinders with a two and a half inch bore and a six inch stroke set side by side and over the rear axle. I made them out of the exhaust pipe of a steam engine that I had bought. They developed about four horsepower. The power was transmitted from the motor to the counter shaft by a belt and from the counter shaft to the rear wheel by a chain. The car would hold to people. The seat being suspended on posts and the body on elliptical springs. There were two speeds, one of 10 and the other of 20 miles per hour obtained by shifting the belt, which was done by a clutch lever in front of the driving seat. Thrown forward, the lever put in the high speed, thrown back. The low speed, with the lever upright, the engine could run free. To start the car, it was necessary to turn the motor over by hand, with the clutch free. To stop the car, one simply released the clutch and applied the foot brake. There was no reverse, and speeds other than those of the belt were obtained by the throttle. I bought the iron work for the frame of the carriage, and also the seat and the springs. The wheels were 28-inch wire bicycle wheels with rubber tires. The balance wheel I had cast from a pattern that I made, and all of the more delicate mechanism I made myself. One of the features that I discovered necessary was a compensating gear that permitted the same power to be applied to each of the rear wheels. When turning corners, the machine altogether weighed about 500 pounds. A tank under the seat held three gallons of gasoline, which was fed to the motor through a small pipe and a mixing valve. The ignition was by electric spark. The original machine was aired cooled, or to be more accurate, the motor simply was not cooled at all. I found that on a run of an hour or more the motor heated up. And so I very shortly put a water jacket around the cylinders and piped it to a tank in the rear of the car over the cylinders. Nearly all of these various features had been planned in advance. That is the way I have always worked. I draw a plan and work out every detail on the plan before starting to build. For otherwise, one will waste a great deal of time in makeshifts as the work goes on and the finished article will not have coherence. It will not be rightly proportioned. Many inventors fail because they do not distinguish between planning and experimenting. The largest building difficulties that I had were in obtaining the proper materials. The next were with tools. There had to be some adjustments and changes in details of the design. But what held me up most was that I had neither the time nor the money to search for the best material for each part. But in the spring of 1893, the machine was running to my partial satisfaction and giving an opportunity further to test out the design and material on the road. 